In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're in a series right now. It's called Living With Yourself. And, and what this is about is this is three habits to safeguard your soul. Now, I don't feel like I did a good job last week of really like touching on this. And so I wanted to kind of back up a little bit and address something and then we can move forward. But the whole purpose of this series, the whole reason that we're doing this is because I believe that we need to safeguard our soul. So this whole last week's message... Today's message, next week's message, is all about safeguarding your soul, our soul, my soul. That, that's the purpose of it. It's not just to make you a better purpose, by make you a better person by teaching you how to live a better way or by teaching you how to, we talked about last week where you combine all those fractured uh, versions of yourself that you are to different groups and people and becoming one version of yourself. I mean, that's great. That's a great thing to do. That's what we want. That's freedom. But really, the purpose in why we do that is because we want to safeguard our soul. And so I thought, let me back up a little bit. Because today, it's the second part of this. And we'll talk about what that means for us today. But first, I want to talk about what is a soul? But I think that we make a lot of assumptions, especially, you know, us as communicators, preachers, teachers, whatever you want to call us, where we say things like, let's safeguard our soul, and then we just run forward with, well, this is what it's going to be about. But wh what exactly is a soul? You know, th th this is hard, but, but when I looked this up and I did some research, every religion, every people group, they all have a definition for what a soul is, and including the Bible. And funny enough, they're all kind of the same thing. And I'm not saying that, that they all have the same value or importance because we believe that what the Bible teaches is the ultimate truth. That what, what's in between those pages there is the, the word of God and that is the, the truth that we believe. But it's interesting because when you watch other religions and other groups, other, other uh, entities or people groups, as they try and put definitions to something, they don't even know it, but they actually get quite close to what God intended for it to be. And when you look at what is a soul... Well, the soul is, is the immaterial or spiritual part of who we are. It, it's the thing that a lot of uh, religions and people groups, and I mean, even us, we believe that this is the immortal part of us. Now, it's hard to define that because we can't, we can't pull it out of our pocket. We can't, we can't touch it. We can't kind of move it to the side. We can't give it to somebody else. We can't take from somebody else. If we have surgery... There's nowhere that a surgeon is going to find our soul that's inside of us. You know, it, it's something that we, we, can't, we can't find it. We can't touch it. There's nothing that we can do to surface it. But you know what? The world can break it. It's, it's something that, that we, can't, we can't put a, a, a tangible sense to. But it's one of the most real things that we have. And, and I, I was thinking through, okay, well then what... what constitutes or defines when we have a soul or how do we know if we have a soul and you know I thought okay is it is it our ability to know right from wrong that that then makes me different from the lego block that I stepped on this morning when I got out of bed it, the, the lego block can't cuss I didn't cuss either but I could have but what, what is it that, make, that gives me the soul and not the Lego block? Is it because I know right from wrong and it doesn't know right from wrong? Is it because I have the ability to show emotion and it doesn't have the ability to show emotion? Now, I would even say to that, you know, that, no, that's not even what defines whether or not we have a soul. Because what about a baby? You know, when a baby is born, they don't know right from wrong. If you put a big, uh, uh, blow up the world and push this button button in front of a baby, it's, it, 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 it's going to swing and hit the button. It doesn't know if it's right or if it's wrong. But that doesn't mean that that baby doesn't have a soul. And what about people that don't know how to express emotion? Maybe they're autistic. They're somewhere on the, on the spectrum or they have a certain disability that, that prevents them from being able to do that. It doesn't mean that they don't have a soul. You know, and I could go on and on and on. What are all the qualifiers that we could think of to determine whether something has a soul or whether something doesn't have a soul? And I can argue in and out of every single one of them. But at the end of the day, I believe, and so do many other Christians, theologians, scholars, philosophers, that we believe that this is the immaterial. It's the spiritual essence of who we are. And in fact, we believe that it is the eternal essence, or the eternal part to who that we are. See, nothing in you is eternal except for your soul. 
That's the only thing that will outlast you. You, you know, you, you always hear you can't take it to the grave with you. You know what? You don't take your soul to the grave with you either. Because when you die, it goes somewhere. It goes somewhere else. It's the only thing that lasts forever. So if it's the only thing that lasts forever, if it's the only thing that we have that's eternal, then why would we not want to know how to take care of it? Why would we not want to know how to safeguard it? We do. We need to know how to safeguard our soul. Because when you're long and gone, your soul will have continued on somewhere else. So what is it for us? What is it to safeguard our soul? Well, th this means if you look at the word safeguard, it means that we're going to protect it. It means that we're going to shield it. It means that we're going we're to create a barrier of safety around it. We're not going to leave it out in the open so that it can be exposed to the elements of humanity, so that it can be just shattered and tattered. We're, we're going to protect it. That's what safeguarding means. Safeguarding, that word, when you look at the, the original kind of meaning of it, it's talking about almost like standing in a high tower and looking out over. You're, you're making sure not only is it protected, but I'm not even going to let anything approach it. I'm not even going to let anything come near it. And so when we talk about safeguarding our soul, because remember your soul, we're going to come back to this over and over and over and over and over again. We safeguard our soul because our soul is the only thing in us that is going to be eternal, that's going to last past us. That's the only thing. And so if it's the only thing, then doesn't it make sense that we take really good care of it? And if you can believe, even in theory, if you can believe that your soul is the only eternal thing that's going to outlast you, then don't you want to put it in the hands of something that is also eternal? Well, if you would want to put an eternal thing that's going to outlast you into the hands of another eternal thing that will outlast you, then don't you want to put it into the hands of the most loving, wonderful, forgiving, grace-filled, mercy-filled version of an eternal thing that's going to outlast you. I would think, if you take God out of this, if I explain this to my four-year-old, he's, yeah, daddy, yeah, I want to, that's who I want to give it to. That makes sense. You know, we, we complicate this thing as we get older and as life happens to us, you know, we, we, it overcomplicates, but it's really that simple. I've got this special little sparkle in me that God's given me and that's my soul. And it's going to last beyond me. And I want to put it in the hands of the most loving creator, the most loving eternal thing that there is, and that's God. And so I'm going to make sure that I safeguard my soul so that when I'm gone, it goes into the hands of my loving heavenly father. That's what it means when we safeguard our soul. Now, how is it that we actually do this? There's two things. There's, well, there's multiple things. There's, we protect ourselves from the outside. That's one thing. Yes. But there's also two things within us that we have to safeguard our soul from. There's two things that we have control over, that we have, have the ability to, to manipulate or to change, have, have control over. A lot of things you don't have control over. But there's two things that you do. We talked about one of them last week. We talked about your will. And this week we're talking about our heart. But when, when we safeguard our soul, two of the things that we're focusing on in this series is that we've got to surrender our will and we've got to maintain our heart. Now, what, what does this mean? If you weren't here last week, I can sum it up for you super easy. If you, a lot of us can barely manage our own finances. A, a lot of us, we, we've had, we have a drawer in our house that for over a week has been sitting on the countertop because uh, I couldn't figure out how to screw it back in in the right way so that when it would go slide into the, into the it's the one where all the salt and pepper and spices are. It's the most important one that's in the kitchen because every time you're cooking and you pull the drawer out to get the salt and pepper out or the olive oil, the whole thing goes and falls all the way down to the floor. So my wife's just been setting it on the counter. Just there's this open drawer on the countertop. It, it took me until last night to figure out how to get that fixed. How, how in the world am I going to manage my own will when I can barely fix a drawer that goes into cabinets to hold the salt and the pepper? We can barely manage our own finances when we're left to our own devices. We can't manage our own relationships well because our will, our intentions get in the way and they hurt that. 
So when you talk about managing your own will as far as your soul and eternity is concerned, that's something that we really would be better if we surrender that, if we give that up. And so what that means to surrender that will is, is to say, okay, I'm not the best at this, God. God that I don't believe in, God that I'm experimenting with believing in, God that I've believed in for the last 50 years of my life, wherever you are on that spectrum there. God, I'm not the best at this, but I hear that you're pretty good at it. So today, I'm going to start my day, I surrender my will. I'm not going to try and fit in here or fit in there. I'm not going to try and fracture myself so that I fit in with all these different groups, so that now there's all these different versions of myself. Because if you've not submitted your will, if you've not surrendered your will, what have you done? You've walked into all your friend groups, you've walked into work, you've got your family, where there's a version of Chris that's great around these people, there's a version of Chris that's not so great around these people. Then there's a version of Chris that's like super relaxed, around these people, but if I was this way around those people, if I was that way here at my job, then I may not have a job because those two versions are so far apart from each other. And when we're in charge of ourselves, our will and our way, we create all these different versions and they get really, really, really far apart. And that's exhausting and that's hard to manage. So simple solution to that is you start out the day and you say, God, I surrender my will. Which means, Lord, I'm just one person, and I, that one person is surrendered to you. Now, you be in charge. You tell me who to be, how to be. You tell me how I go about the day. You define my character. You define what's in me. You define what I say. And all of a sudden, it becomes really easy, because we don't have to think of that stuff. God does it for us. We've surrendered our will to Him. Now, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about maintaining our heart. Now, this is so connected to our soul. It's so very connected, but it, it, it's an easy one to miss. It's really easy to miss. In fact, we can miss this because there's such a great message around maintaining our heart that it's easy to just get the message about maintaining our heart and not connect it to the part about taking care of our soul. So that, that today is the journey that we're going to go on today. And I'm always going to keep taking it back to the value of your soul and why we safeguard our soul. Let's look at what Solomon said here. Solomon has got a verse for us. Okay, there we go. In Proverbs 4, 23, it says this. And Solomon, uh, da the son of David, a wise guy, very wise guy. He says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from your heart. Okay, that's the message around maintaining your heart. Everything that you do comes out of your heart. It's a beautiful message, but we're going to take it further and we're going to connect it to actually taking care of and safeguarding our soul. But before we do that, or actually in order to show you how we're going to do that, I want to talk with you about what we can go from just after Solomon and we go into um, all the way up to the time of Jesus. But if we look at the Jewish religion, the Jewish traditions especially, they had two main sources of law. So law number one was the Ten Commandments. And, and these, if, if you don't understand what I'm talking about when I say the Jewish religion or tradition, I'm talking about the, the people that came from Abraham. God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, descendants. And all those people became the Israelites. And then the Israelites took over the land that God had for them, and they became the, the Jewish people. And then you had King David... And you had uh, uh, Saul before him, and then Solomon, and then some other kings. And Israel becomes a nation. And then you have, out of that, that, that nation of Israel becomes the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are then uh, governed by these two sets of laws. First set is the Torah. Now the Torah is considered to be what is written down. So this is the first five books of what you would call as the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy, Numbers. Those are the five books of the Torah. That is the written law. It is, it is considered that when, when Moses went up on the mountain and he goes up to meet with God where he gets the Ten Commandments, he gets the Ten Commandments, he writes those down, and then also there's the written law in those books that's the Torah. That governs the, the Jewish 
religion, the Jewish culture, the Jewish everything. And along with the, the Torah, you also have this thing called the oral Torah. And what this was is that they believed that when Moses went up the mountain, that God gave him the, the, the rules. He gave, here's Moses, write this down. This is really important, write this down. And, and I don't know if you guys know anybody that's like this. I do this to my staff all the time. Like, hey, write this down. And while they're writing it down, I'm also giving them a whole bunch of other important pieces of information, but not giving them the time to write that down. And so it really sets them up well for success. So I wonder if, if God's up there with Moses and Moses is like, you know, it's not super easy to write this down, God. You know, I'm chipping this into the, you know, the tablets here. I've already broken one. I'm back to get another one. And God's like, well, while you're doing that, hey, here's some other stuff that I want to tell you about. And so it's assumed that, that Moses comes down with the written part and the unwritten part. And the unwritten part is known as the oral part because it gets passed down from generation to generation to generation. So this, this doesn't get written down until way, 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 way later. Eventually it would be written down. But for the context of our story today, of what we're looking at, it's, it's not written down. Another way to think about the oral Torah is we look at it like fence rules. So we have a swimming pool at our house. It's one thing if I tell Benjamin, hey, Benjamin. Well, first of all, Benjamin is 18 months old. Not, well, he was born in April. So he's a year and since April, whatever that is. He's this tall. So for me to <laughs> Wyatt, sorry. I said the wrong child. <laughs> yeah, you guys know, right? It's all the same. It blends. They all blend. One of our children is this tall. Okay. And he is, he is a, he is a go, go, go. Uh, this morning when I left, I put a dry race board in front of where my office is. It doesn't have a door, but I know that there's lots of little things in there that he likes to get his grubby little meat sticks on. And so if he can get in there and unplug stuff and grab stuff, he, he will. And so we have a swimming pool, but if I were to say, hey, uh, Wyatt, if you go into the swimming pool, then you will, you'll drown. Don't go into the pool. That pool means death for you. Like, well, that's some extreme parenting. And it's up to him to follow that or not follow that. Well, that's not very fair because uh, Wyatt's not that smart. He's young. He's apt to make the wrong decision or not even know when he's making the wrong decision. So what we have in our house is we have a fence rule. The fence rule is, is that there's an actual fence that's around the swimming pool. That fence keeps Wyatt from breaking the important rule, which is don't go in the swimming pool until you can swim. That's the idea of the fence rules in the oral Torah. This was a set of rules that were created, maintained, kind of altered a little bit by the Pharisees and the priests over time. But these rules were set up so that the actual rule could not be broken. Kids, I don't know if young, young adults, young kids, old kids, you know, you think that you've got a lot of rules in your house, you know, right now. This is, this is an unbelievable set of rules. Rules to protect you from breaking the rule that breaks the rule that breaks the rule. And we're going to look at a story today that, that centers around, you know, none other than hand washing. You know, hand washing is something that became really serious to all of us with COVID. You know, hey, we got to make sure and wash our hands. All of us walked around and we just alcoholed our hands, you know, as much as we, um, as much as we could everywhere that we went. Um, I really liked the places that had like the strong, I like the smell of cleaning products. It's also a bad thing probably, but, you know, good, strong alcohol-based hand wash. You know, you really feel, you know, clean, you know, at home, I like the smell of a who else likes the smell of like bleach in a bathroom? Thank you. The rest of you are animals, you know? I walk into a bleach smelling bathroom and I think this place is clean. You know, this is good. Then my wife says, don't breathe so deep, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> that's the way that I felt with the hand washing. I knew the places, the mall, I knew, I knew where the good sanitizer was. The stuff where I knew I would really get clean. And the only way that I knew I was really getting my hands clean is if it burned a little bit. That was the good stuff. And, and that, that, there's an issue that comes up around hand washing around Jesus and his disciples here because there's a fence rule that has to do with hand washing. See, the rule that, that Moses was given was that nothing unclean should be eaten. 
because it would defile you. And they had a list. Okay, there's clean meat, there's unclean meat, there's clean fish, there's unclean fish. All the bugs are unclean. The Bible says it right there in the Old Testament. All the bugs are unclean. So all, everyone that eats bugs, you know, out there, they're all unclean. There's no exception there for those. And so they've got all these rules about what they can and can't eat. And what the Pharisees have done is they've said, okay, with the oral Torah, what we can do, because this is passed down, because, you know, somebody's uncle somewhere did something and accidentally ate a bug. And so what they did is they said, well, Uncle Ted ate a bug. So we need to come up with something that will keep people like Uncle Ted from picking up bugs and eating bugs. So let's create something that's part of the oral Torah. That way we keep people from accidentally eating bugs. That's the gist of what this is. And so they've got a a rule around hand washing. There's a certain way that they have to wash their hands to make sure that nothing unclean enters into their body. And that's where we pick up on our story today. And that's where we're about to have Jesus expose the, the heart and why the heart needs to be maintained and why the heart is connected with the soul. So let's jump in here. In Matthew, we find in, in chapter 15 here, see the Pharisees and the, and the scribes from Jerusalem are, are with Jesus and this is significant. I want to set the, the stage for you. Jesus is there. His disciples are there. The fact that the Pharisees are there and the scribes, the people that write the the law down, they are also there. They have come from the mother city, from the mothership to watch and observe Jesus because they want to try and see how they can get him into trouble. So the whole reason that they're even in this story is because they're trying to set him up for failure. They're down there to to wave a finger at what he's doing and find out how he's ruining everything that has to do with Jewish religion and and culture and tradition. And they want to make sure that they catch him in the act of it. And they feel like that they've done that here. And so the Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem, they come to Jesus and he says, hey, uh, why do your disciples violate the tradition? It's not the written law. It's the oral Torah the passed down tradition. So why do they violate the tradition that's been handed down by the Jewish elders? See, they're, they're, they're upset. We set the oral Torah there and we set these traditions in place and your disciples aren't doing those. And then they go on here and, and they say, for your disciples, they do not, and this is important, ceremonially wash their hands before they eat. So here we have it. The oral Torah has been violated. And these, these guys are very upset because this is their tradition. The Pharisees and the scribes, they set what is the oral Torah. And what's great about that for them is that makes the law work for them. And therefore, the people have to work for the law. Therefore, the people will always need the Pharisees and the scribes. So they've created this complex set of rules here. The disciples are like, well, we just... We don't have to follow that. We don't do that. And I I love that. And so Jesus here, after he hears their their complaints, Jesus has this very, very slick reply. And I I, I would hate to challenge Jesus on anything, but they do here. And so Jesus replies to them and he reveals how he knows what they're doing. He reveals that he knows their heart. He knows what's happening in their heart when they make these rules and these regulations. And he says, and why do you... By your traditions, so okay, by your oral Torah, by your laws, why do you violate the direct commandments of God? So right there he said, you've got what God said, you've got what you said to protect what God said. You have taken what you've said and you've placed it over what God has said. So Jesus right up front lets them know, you have flipped this thing the wrong way. Then he goes on to say, for instance... So he says, I'm going to give you an example of how you've done this. God tells you that you're supposed to honor your father and mother. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. I've got a four-year-old out there (laughs) that is in Wombaland right now. If you have a child that's around that age of my son, Benjamin, I apologize Somebody needs to read this to him every single morning. (laughs) Benjamin, if you argue with mom and dad, no. So this is the 
This is the law here, the actual law, the one that comes from, from God's voice to Moses. Honor your father and your mother and don't even speak disrespectfully about them. So then he, he goes on in the, in the next verse and he says, in verse five, he says, but you say that it's all right for people. So now he's calling out their tradition. He says, priest, scribe, Pharisee, you guys say it's all right for you to tell people that they can tell their parents, sorry, I can't help you for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. See, the Pharisees again have flipped things around here. So according to the oral tradition, they didn't have to take care of their parents. That when their parents grew old and, and they needed cared for, they needed financially being taken care of, they would say, oh, you know, I, I would love to help you out, you know, buy you food, put you up in that home or build a, a flat onto the back of my house, but this is God's, God's money, you know? You can't argue with that. I'd say, all this extra here, I've got to to give it to God. And they would put their parents out on the street. So Jesus calls them on that, starting to reveal the heart issue behind their oral tradition. And then he goes on the next verse in verse 6, and he says, In this way, you say that they don't need to honor their parents. And so you, see, I've highlighted you in here, because this is not God's law. This is the reflection of the heart of the Pharisees. It's their tradition. You say they don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. Now, after that, Jesus realizes this is a perfect teachable moment here. This is a place where I've got everyone's attention. I've made the Pharisees and scribes mad. So their, their ears are hot. They're burning. They're aggravated. So let me, just, let me just really put the nail in the coffin here on this. So he, he goes in verse 10. He says this to them. He says, after Jesus calls the crowd to him, he says, listen and understand this. So he's, I want to tell you something. I want you to understand and know a truth. So let me tell you what this truth is. It's not what goes into the mouth of a man that defiles and dishonors him. He's talking about the hand washing thing. The whole point in washing your hand, the way that the Pharisees wanted you to, was so that you didn't accidentally put something unclean into your mouth and then it would defile you. And what they mean by defile you is it keeps you away from God. It makes you unclean before God. It means that you are, are, are unable to approach God or the temple. It, 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 it removes you from the presence of God. You don't want to be defiled because then you're separated from God. So Jesus says it's not about washing your hands or what goes in that defiles you. Instead, it's not what goes into the mouth of a man that defiles and dishonors him, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles and dishonors him. See, Jesus has flipped this whole thing here now. Now, we don't understand the weight and the gravity of this. See, imagine this. Jesus is there and, and he's got a crowd of, of Jewish people around him and he's got the, the biggest top dog Teachers, I mean, if they had load shedding back then and these guys showed up, the power would come back on because they would not sit in the dark for this. And they're there to persecute Jesus. And Jesus says, not only is your heart wrong, not only are you doing it wrong, but in fact, the whole underpinning of your entire oral Torah is wrong. The whole underpinning of everything, almost everything you believe is wrong because your heart is in the wrong place. You've not maintained or taken care of your heart and look at where it's gotten you. You are now putting your own rules and regulations above God's. Now when he does this, it does create an issue. And Jesus leaves. They just leave after this is done. And when he leaves, the disciples, they're like, hey, uh, did you know that that was maybe kind of like a, a mess that just happened back there? And so Jesus is like... Come on, guys. And actually asking him, uh, we don't understand what you were saying, Jesus. And then I think Jesus, you know, because he's around his inner circle here, I think he responds in kind of a, a, a fun, I don't know, I'd like to think of it kind of a fun sort of pokey way here. So we, this is where the story, I jumped to, to Mark. This story is in Matthew and, and it's in Mark. And it's the same story, but I really like the way that Mark puts these next couple of verses. So I switched over to Mark here. Mark 7 and verse 17, so Jesus, after he'd left and he'd entered his house, the disciples asked him about the parable, because Jesus had told this parable to help explain this, this clean, unclean kind of thing here. And so Jesus, in verse 18, he says, are you so dull? Like, are you, come on, guys. Are you, I mean, you imagine the, the, the savior of the world 
been like dull. I wonder if he actually said dull or if Mark just wrote down a kinder word there. I, I don't know. But he says, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? So right there, he's saying all that mess about clean and unclean, there is no unclean food because everything is clean because it's not about what goes in that defiles you. And then he, he goes on in, in verse 19 and he says, for it doesn't go into the heart, a little bit of anatomy for us here. What goes in doesn't go into the heart, it goes into the stomach and then it goes out the body. And in saying this, Jesus declared that all the food was actually clean. So this is a moment here where we have that Jesus completely breaks down a fence. He breaks down this fence rule. He has, has just really put it into a perspective that we can all grasp. It's not what goes in, because what goes in doesn't go to the heart. It goes in and it passes out. That's not what makes you clean or makes you unclean. And so Jesus explains this more. He goes into the next verse in verse 20 here. And he says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, so out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. So this is the part around this verse that, that we get to, but we don't connect it with our soul. But this is still such a good part. It's Jesus is saying that, that what comes out is what defiles you. And also, here's the nasty things that can come out of your heart. Listen to this list that Jesus gives. And if these things that register with you, these things are coming from your heart. They're not coming from your mind. They're not coming from some other part of you. These are coming from, from your heart, from the center of who you are here. And so it says these, these evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside. And that is what defiles a person. So really what Jesus is saying here for all of us, and this is, this is the truth here, is that your behavior will eventually reflect the condition of your heart. So your behavior outwardly will eventually reflect the condition of what is inward in you. There's no avoiding that. Je Jesus has laid that out, plain and simple. And this is, this is the truth. I want you to get this here. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this to your soul. But first you have to get this, this part here. Whatever is coming out of you, the way you respond to your significant other, the way that you uh, respond at work, uh, whether you're snappy or not, whether you're rude or not, whether you're nice or not, whether you're okay with the affair or okay with the addiction, Whatever it is that's coming out of you that's not good, that means that there's something inside of you that's not good. See, this heart thing here, it impacts what's coming out. So if you want to know how good someone is on the inside, well, you can look at what's happening on the outside. Look at what's coming out of them. And I'm not talking about, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. That, that's not what I'm saying. But if you've got somebody that's telling lies and that's, that's deceitful, that's, that's stealing, that's doing things like that, you can pretty much guarantee that there's a heart issue that's happening there. So your behavior will eventually and always reflect the condition of your heart. So here's the question for the soul. Here's our question today. If your soul is worth safe, safeguarding, then you have to maintain your heart. Because remember, the heart, out of the heart, is where our behaviors come from. So if your soul is worth safeguarding, so we safeguard our soul because it's the only thing that outlasts us. We want to take care of our soul. And we learned last week, so we surrender our will to it. But now what we need to understand is how do we take care of it? And the way we take care of it is we take care of our heart. If you want to safeguard your soul, you have to maintain your heart. Because what happens in the heart is eventually what's going to happen out here. Now there's four things that I have for you today. These are not, it's not every sin, it's not every category, but this covers just about all of them. You know, when you learn how to drive, you don't have to learn how to rebuild the engine, but you need to learn how to take care of tires, 
You need to learn how to take care of the, the oil and how to check the water. There's a couple things that if you know how to do those things, you can pretty much take care of the whole vehicle. You can maintain it. So what are those things for our heart? Those things for our heart is this here, guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. These are four areas that if you look inside your heart and you, you do a maintenance check on your heart and you find that there's guilt, you find that there's anger, you find there's greed or there's jealousy, that you need to do some maintenance work on that heart of yours. These four things here, they can defile you. And as they do that, they will end up defining you. And because this is who you will become. Because this is what will come out of you if you don't maintain your heart and get these things changed or get these things taken care of. So I want you every, to, to, we're going to all take a personal audit here. And, and, and this is so simple to do. We're going to start with guilt. If you have guilt in your heart, then there's a good chance that there's a statement that you're thinking in your mind that goes something along the lines of I owe you. I've done something wrong, and so I owe you for it. I'm a bad person. I owe you because of this. This guilt and this statement, I owe you, it's a cancer, and it's toxic. And you know how we get rid of this cancer, how we get rid of this toxic language and these toxic thoughts in us? Well, we, we instead, we confess. So instead of walking around carrying the guilt, always assuming that I owe somebody something, instead, we confess it. And when we confess, it does get messy, and that's okay. But when you confess what you're feeling guilty about, that's going to set you free. You've now maintained part of your heart. And we, we look at anger. If you feel anger, then you're probably having statements roll around in, in your mind, something along the lines of, you owe me, because I'm so mad. You hurt me. I'm so mad. I'm so angry. That is going to enslave you and make you a captive for all of your life. It'll actually make you sick. Because you can't live in a state of anger for so long without it physically impacting you. So the way that we get over anger, the way that we conquer the statement of you owe me, is we forgive. So now we've done maintenance in two of the four areas on our heart. We found the guilt, we've confessed it, we found the anger, we've forgiven it. The third one, greed. Greed is a, is a big one. Greed says, I owe me. It's mine. It came to me, and so I, I owe me. I get to hold on to it. I get to keep it. That, that greed, it will just be, it'll suck life and suck from everybody around you if you're carrying greed. Because there's something deep in you that says, I'm entitled to this. I'm owed this. The way that we maintain our hearts against greed is we give. So instead of having a heart of greed, we have a heart of generosity. I love Andy Stanley talks about a definition of generosity as being you, you taking what God has given you and you helping it find the right place to go. So all the finances that God has recently given you, you take some of that for yourself, but you know, a lot of it, it's about you helping other people or other things or other organizations or whatever it is, receive what God has given you. You're just stewarding it out there. So we don't want to be greedy. We don't want to walk around saying, I owe me. Instead, we give. And the last thing that we'll talk about in doing maintenance, and this is a big one here, probably the, 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 the biggest one of all of them is jealousy. And that's us saying, life owes me. Why is this good thing happening to your neighbor and not to you? Why, why, are someone, why is someone else getting the promotion and you didn't? Why does someone else have money and you don't? Why did somebody else, you know, get out of university and get married and have kids? And their life looks amazing, but your life doesn't look that way. You're thinking, that's not fair. I'm jealous and life owes me. What's dangerous about this statement is that actually what this statement really is saying is that God owes me. So I'm jealous because God should give me and do for me. Why hasn't he done it for me? You see, the way that we maintain our heart from this is we're not jealous. Instead, we celebrate. We look for every opportunity that we have to celebrate and to celebrate another person or another event or another thing. See, what you have to do is you've got to root these things out in your heart here. See, we heard today a story where Jesus confronts the Pharisees and he basically is saying, 
It's not what goes in that makes you unclean and defiles you. It's what comes out. So if we're, safe, if we're safeguarding our soul, we want to surrender our will and we want to maintain our heart. And I just gave you four easy ways to maintain your heart. Well, not easy, but there's only four. It's not a list of 200. It's four. If you can look at these things here and say, what's coming out of my heart? Is it one of these things? And if it's one of these things, turn it into one of these over here. Do some maintenance on your heart. Because that it doesn't defile you. This defiles you. This unites you. It draws you closer to your creator. Closer to your identity. Who you actually, actually were created to be. And that is the best way that I know of to safeguard your soul. So I'm going to pray for us. And, and I pray that in this moment that this is a chance for, for God to speak to you. And I would just have, um, you know, my request to God would be this. It would just be that you, as you sit here and as you listen to the next song that we have coming up, that, that God just lays on your heart something that just needs to be maintained. And also that God lays on your heart how special your soul is and how special you are. You're so wonderfully made and you're so special. And God's given you the special, the, the sparkle that he's given you that's so unique to you. And now it's just about maintaining that. 